Hello everyone and welcome to my first of two videos on this, the Pentax Auto 110. This is a fascinating, very little camera. For comparison, uh, here's how big it is next to a Pentax LX, which is considered a small 35 millimeter SLR camera. And as you can see, it absolutely makes this guy look like it almost doesn't exist. So the Auto 110 is a full system interchangeable lens SLR that uses 110 cartridge film. I wish I could show you what that looks like, but I am plumb out of it. It creates images that are 13 millimeters by 17 millimeters. So I'll show you the size of that. This opening right here is how big the negative, uh, negatives are that it creates. It has, to say it's an interchangeable lens camera simply means that lenses can be taken off and put back on at any point when you're not taking a picture without impairing the image quality because of the shutter in there. It has a center weighted meter and what that means is that if what you're seeing now is a scene that you wanted to take a picture of for some reason no one would understand, what's in the center of the image about what's inside this box I'm making with my fingers would inform the majority of the meter reading and what's outside of it would inform less. It's either a 60-40 or 75-20 split, something about like that, probably 60-40. The shutter speeds on this camera go from a full second to 1 750th. There is no way for you to override the shutter speed that the camera says you want you should use, um, except kind of, we'll talk about that in the second video. But it's a program mode only camera, which means the camera will take the scene that you give it and pick the best exposure for the type of film it has in it. It has a 0.75x viewfinder right here, meaning that what is in you see through the viewfinder is three quarters of the size of what's coming in through the lens. That's tiny. I think that is the tiniest viewfinder I've ever seen on a camera, but realistically, much bigger than that, and the camera just it wouldn't fit together. The frame coverage in this is 87%, which is again, I think the lowest or darn near the lowest of any camera that I've ever reviewed. And what that means is that if you were looking through the viewfinder and you saw this image right here, 13% of the frame that you don't see would still end up on the film. It gives you a lot of room to crop. And because these were consumer grade cameras meant to have their film processed at photo labs, where the photo labs would automatically be cropping images anyway. They, they do that a lot, or used to, to do that a lot in, back in the day. That 13% loss wasn't a big deal because the um, photo lab was gonna pick the best alignment for each print anyhow. It has a fixed split prism focusing screen and the flash sync speed on this is 1 30th. However, it can only use a proprietary flash that plugs into here. This is not a flash PC port. So if you don't have the proprietary flash for this camera, you're not doing flash photography with it anyway. I don't have that flash, so I can't really show you anything about how to use it. There might be two flashes, but at any rate, they're proprietary. This does not use standard flashes. The target market for the Pentax Auto 110 were, well, it's kind of hard to call it entry level, but it was seen as a bridge between point and shoot 110 cameras and 35 millimeter SLRs. So the idea was someone would start off with a point and shoot 110 or a disc camera. Then they'd say, hey, I'm enjoying this. Let me buy this inexpensive SLR system. Oh, hey, now I'm comfortable with this. Let me upgrade to a 35 millimeter SLR. It was an entry level camera meant to be easily carried and also meant to be a gateway drug for bigger and better cameras. This was also intended for travel use. So it's a very good system. You can carry an entire system in a box that's not much bigger than a 35 millimeter SLR. So it's a very good travel camera as well. It, was, it is the smallest SLR ever made. There are reports online, which are always worth questioning, that the Russian made Narzis camera is smaller, however, the Narzis is larger in every dimension, width, height, and depth than the Auto 110. The Narzis also weighs more than this camera. There are very few items in the supporting system for this camera. It's one of the smallest systems ever made. You can get six lenses, 
two motor drive winders that can connect into the bottom, two flashes, a belt clip, this uh, camera strap, wrist strap right here, and then there are two camera models in the system. By the time this came out, basically the 110 film craze was petering out anyway. Uh, it is a fully programmed mode camera with no manual exposure controls of any kind for the user, and it can only stop down lenses to f13.5. Now, one of the reasons is if you've gotten your hands on one of these, this lens looks a little bit weird, right? There's no aperture ring on it. None of the lenses for the system have an aperture ring on them. I have, I have four of them here and they are all without it. And that's because that little square opening right there, that's a leaf shutter that's also the aperture. And the way that the shutter on this camera works is fascinating. When you take a picture, see if it'll let me do that. Nope, it won't because I don't have film in here. When you take a picture, the leaves here close. Then the mirror, the mirror in here is light tight. It flips up and then these, mirror, these two leaves open to the correct aperture and then they close again and then the mirror drops down. So they, they open to the correct aperture, they stay open for the correct shutter time and then they close. So it has technically two shutters, a leaf shutter that's also the aperture and behind it a mirror that works as a shutter because it's light proof when the leaves are open for focusing your, uh, your image with the lenses here. These were made by the Asahi Optical Company in Japan from 1978 until it, I think about 1982, which is when the auto was released. I couldn't find a specific date for when these went out of production, but it seems logical that they would be discontinued before the successor camera hit the market. They were preceded by nothing whatsoever. This was an entirely new camera system for which Pentax went back to the drawing board and said, how can we make this thing work? In fact, if this were scaled up with the same mechanics to a 35 millimeter camera size, it would be eight times as big as this and weigh four pounds, if I remember correctly. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a design that only works for 110 and will not work for any other camera uh, film format, period. It was concurrent with the Pentax K line as well as some of the M cameras, and then it was followed by the 110 Super. So here we are on top of the Pentax Auto 110. Over here we have the flash contact pin. When you put the flash units on here, they push this button down and that lets the camera know that the flash is on it. This is the electronic contact that allows the flash to know when the shutter has been triggered so that it will fire. This pin lets the, flat, the camera know to, to fire at 1 30th of a second. Prism housing. This is the shutter release button. This is the double stroke advance, meaning that if you want to advance the film, you have to hit this twice or it will not advance the film and arm the shutter. On the front of the camera, we have the strap holder here. This is the, the, the system wrist strap, but if you don't have this, any fabric strap of the same width can fit through there and be used. This is the lens release button over here on the side. This is what you use, take the lens on and off of the camera with. Lens mounting index dot, lens flange, and shutter, leaf shutter assembly model number and Asahi Pentax up here. On the bottom of the camera, we have the mechanical couplings for the auto winder. Asahi Optical Company in Japan. This is where it was made and by whom. Serial number and an alignment pin and an electrical contact area for the auto winder there. On the back of the camera, we have this window that lets you see what type of film you have and what frame you are on. Uh, 110 film typically has 24 frames. On the side of the camera right here, we have a button that you push down to open up the film back. I don't have a 110 cartridge, unfortunately, but it just sits right in here. It, it's shaped, it has like a bulbous area, then a bridge, and then a bulbous area, and then they just drop right in. So this is where the 110 cartridge goes. This is your shutter box. The, you can see in there the, the back of the mirror that uh, flips down when the camera's not in use your battery area and battery holding clip. And I'll show you how to change the batteries in video two. 
And then on the back, we have these little springs that help hold the 110 cassette in place. I mean, it's much on the outside, it's much simpler than the cameras that we typically, typically take a look at in that there aren't very many things. And, uh, but inside, mechanically, it's substantially more complicated. If this camera were to be made into a 35 millimeter camera, it would be about twice as large or four times as large, something like that, as a 35 millimeter SLR. When, Pen when Pentax released the Auto 110, the 110 film format was already considered dead. Um, by the late 70s, it was, it, was, it was recognized it wasn't gonna be viable going forward. So my guess is Pentax had put tons of R&D into this and just decided, well, let's get it out there and see if we can recoup some money, just a guess. How the subsequent camera to this came along, the, old, the Auto 110 Super, I'll, I'll never know because by the time it came out in the, the early 80s, 110 was really on its way out. The American Standards Association, which back in the day when this was released, set the standard for, for how film speed was calculated. Those standards are now governed by ISO. The ASA said that in their written document of 110 film standards, that they would recognize three ISO speeds, 100, 200, and 400. 110 at that time of the, uh, of the current ASA document for, for when this camera was released, recognized three 110 ISOs, what they called ASA speeds back then, ISOs, the modern term. At the time that this camera was released, Kodak was the primary producer of 110 film, and they were only making two speeds of 110 film. Kodak termed them slow and fast. Kodak produced the majority of 110 cameras, but so did you know, Minolta made a bunch of them, Pentax made, made these, and there were some other makers. So Kodak said to the makers, we're gonna make slow and fast film. You determine what the ISO for those is in for metering purposes. Most manufacturers meter slow uh, 110 film as though it was 100 ISO, and fast as though it were 250 ISO. The Pentax 110 system identifies slow speed film as 80, and fast film as 400. So when it meters, it's metering either at 80 ISO or 400. Where that's a serious problem is with this camera and films like Lomo Tiger 200, which it recognizes as fast, and so it underexposes 200 by a stop consistently. Films like Lomo Orca, which are 80 or 100 ISO films, respond very well to the way that the Auto 110 meters scenes. But if you're using one of the Lomo films that are not 80 or 400, uh, if, it's, if it's slower than 400, it's going to be underexposed by this camera. That's just part of using the system. That said, uh, if you're shooting 110, you're probably not expecting magnificent image quality. So having it underexposed to stop, not a huge deal. There was a time in the past when every single 35 millimeter stock of film could be bought in 110. That includes Ektachrome. Uh, those days don't exist anymore. So in a word, the modern 110 film selection is fairly abysmal. And unless you are going to the extreme trouble of slitting it and respooling it yourself, which I don't even have any interest in doing, um, shooting 110 film is an expensive format and it's basically something you gotta do because you really love the format or the cameras. So some things not to do with your Pentax Auto 110. First one, of course, is don't touch the shutter because you're not getting it repaired. If, one, if, you're, if your 110 breaks, there's no one that I know of who will repair one of these. They're mechanically complex and frankly not worth the effort. So don't, don't touch the shutter because that's a really good way to brick your camera don't leave your camera or your lenses in your car because it's a good way for heat to get into the, the mechanism, make the oils in it very thin, and then they get places they shouldn't be, and then when they get back to their proper viscosity, things don't work correctly. The same thing with cold. If your camera gets super cold in the winter, the oils can get thick and gummy and break down, and then they don't work properly. Also, just in general, leaving your camera in your car is a great way 
to have a broken window and no camera. So, you know, it, it can be really quick. I, I Even if you're just running into the, the state park office to buy your parking pass and so you can toss it on your, your dashboard, take your camera gear with you. Anytime you are out in a car with your camera, don't leave it in your car, take it with you because it's better to have your camera and an intact window than to not have your camera and a broken window. Uh, don't store your camera gear in a plastic bag or box because fungus can get into the lenses. And even though this is only a 110 film camera, the lenses are surprisingly good. And um, I've tested all four of the lenses I have on my Alpha 6000, which is a crop sensor Sony with an, a, an A110 adapter, an Auto 110 adapter. And all of them cover APS-C fairly well. They're only f2.8 lenses. There's, um, there are no Sony Alpha, I'm sorry, so there are no Sony E-mount 110 adapters that have a built-in aperture. Unfortunately, that would be a really good way for someone to make a million dollars. Um, not really. But at any, at any rate, these are sharp. And they do take nice images, and they can take they can be used on at least the crop sensor Sony Alpha uh, Sony E mount cameras as wide open lenses. So don't let them get wet because that fungus, if it gets into your lenses, will really degrade the image quality. If you're only shooting them on 110, you're probably not going to notice the image quality degradation. In all honesty, and I can say that having an 18 millimeter lens that had had some fungus in it, and one that, that didn't, and they took the exact same images. Don't let your camera get wet because it's not weather sealed. In fact, one of the Auto 110s that I bought trying to get one that worked, all of the internal components on the underside, they, there, there was a bunch of metal gears in here, had all rusted because it had sat in water at some point. So it's not using super high-end, water-resistant stainless steel metal or anything like that. The electronics and the gears in here will, will be ruined by water, so don't let it get wet. And just remember that even though it's just a 110 camera, it's a precision tool and it can still take nice images and they are really good for things like hiking and traveling because they don't take up a lot of space or weigh very much. Your Pentax Auto 110 is a precision tool and as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. So this was my video on, my first of two videos on the Auto 110. If this video was helpful, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions, please leave those below. I'm more than happy to respond to those in a day or two. I try to do that fairly regularly. If you have suggestions or comments, also please leave those below. A lot of the way that my videos have emerged over the years and evolved is because of feedback from you. One last thing, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the second part of this video manual.